Uh, take your Bible, turn to Exodus chapter 1. That's up on the screen. And um, I had this picture up there on the screen and some people don't like snakes and I'm one of them. So I took it down for a little bit. But when you get to Exodus uh, chapter 1, just say amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. All right, that's what I like to hear. Don't just take my word for it. Uh, I can tell you one of the problems that does go wrong in a lot of churches nowadays, the reason why the devil is gaining so much ground as far as deceiving people is that because usually most preachers, most pastors and whatnot, uh, they're used to using PowerPoint, which is what I use, but uh, in doing so, they're able to go to whatever translation fits or matches what they want to say. In other words, if they don't like the way uh, the King James says it, then um, they'll go to some other Bible and they'll put that up there. And what's happened is you got people now coming to these big churches that don't even carry a Bible because there's no telling what translation the preacher is going to use from one point to the next in his sermon. And um, but anyway, um, what was that? Where was I going with that? That was really good. Oh, that that's that's one of the ways that the devil is able to deceive people is because they have been distanced from the word of God. And whenever the devil succeeds in distancing you from the Bible, you're in trouble. Amen? You're in deep trouble and you need to get back in the Word of God where you should be and that will also keep you from believing any kind of nonsense that you know is not true because you know the Bible calls the man a liar, calls the thing a lie or you just know the Bible doesn't mention anything about that and uh, I like it when God's people are people of the book. Can I hear you say amen? Now, as you look up on this screen... What do you see? Tell me what you see. Huh? Danger? Okay. Danger. What else do you see? What would characterize what each one of these animals are doing? Huh? Attack mode? Yeah, you're an adult. You, can, you don't have to agree with daddy all the time. Okay? Attack mode, attack mode, attack mode, right? Wickedness. Wickedness, the serpent, okay? Now, your clothes, your clothes, but you're missing something. Yes? He got it. In each picture, you have an animal reacting to the presence of a human being. God, in Genesis 9, put it into the heart of every creature to be afraid of man. So the cobra with his hood... He doesn't always have that hood extended out like that. Most of the time it's in... But when he sees a threat like a human, he expands. The Bible says hell hath enlarged herself. Here is the, the serpent enlarging himself to make himself look bigger. And he's doing that because he is afraid of you. And what he wants to do is make you afraid of him so that you will not bother him. The dogs showing their teeth. You've seen that before, right? You reach down to pet a dog, and when the dog starts going, see these? I just had these put in last week. Okay? That's a dog who is afraid of you. He doesn't know you. He's afraid of you. And he is showing uh, that he is mean, and he's, he's vicious, and he, but he's doing it because he's afraid of you. Wolves with their hackles up 
They've enlarged them. You can tell a wolf. The tail will go down. The ears will come up. Uh, dogs, dogs will do this too. And the head goes down. Okay? That is them trying to expand themselves. Even a spider. Now, I, 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 I thought this was funny the first time I saw the spider do that. But a spider is doing that to any predator, uh, including mankind. What he's trying to do is show you, I, I've got all of this. Look at this. Now, the legs can't do anything. It's the bite. But he's showing you this. He's getting big because he's afraid of you. The cats, cats do it. You have this nice little kitty cat. If you were to shave him, if you were to shave a kitty cat, he would look like a rat. Right? They're not that big. But with all that hair, he has the ability. He'll haunch his back. He'll stick his hair straight up. Ears up, eyes open. Why? Because he is afraid of you. God put that in him. Does everybody follow me so far? Now, here's why I'm saying this. <clears throat> God is so faithful. Um, sometimes I sit down and I'm going, I don't, I don't have a clue what I'm supposed to preach. And yesterday I, I sat down and uh, I, I, I had no idea what to preach. So I did what I should have done earlier that day. I started praying. And I spent some time in prayer. God, they're your people. You love them. <clears throat> God, I'm one of those people. I know you love me. And God, I, I just, I need a message. My people need a message. They're your people. So you preach to them whatever you want to preach. And just get me out of the way. But Lord, I don't want to go against your will. I don't want to say anything that you're not empowering me to say. So God, would you, would you show me where to start? Would you show me what to preach? And I prayed for a while and I got done. And uh, the Holy Ghost was saying Exodus 1. Now, anytime the Holy Ghost says something like that to you and gives you a place to look at, don't assume that because you've already read it, you already know what it's about. If God mentions Scripture to you, go read it. Amen? Is that so hard? If, if you feel like God is leading you with a verse of Scripture, go to that verse of Scripture, look it up, and read it and see what God says. In this case, God just said Exodus 1. And I started reading it, and when I got to um, this part, didn't take long at all, I went, oh, I know what God's saying. I know what He's doing. I get it. And I don't think I've ever preached um, this particular message or a similar message this way. But I want us to look at Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. You have your Bible open. It's up on the screen, but I'd like for your Bible to be open. Now, see, these are the names of the children of, of who? Israel. That means... Israel is the name that God gave to Jacob after Jacob wrestled with the Lord all night long. God said, no longer shalt thou be called J Jacob, but Israel. For as a man thou hast wrestled with God and prevailed. I would ask you this morning, if there are serious things going on in your life or in the life of somebody you love and care for, I would ask you, when is the last time that you prevailed in prayer? When is the last time that you decided that you were going to pray and you were not going to stop until God either gave you a sign that it was okay to stop and He's going to do something good or you're going to pray until God does something. And if it's been a while, I would say probably there's people in your life that have such tremendous needs, one of them probably is salvation. 
They need somebody praying for them because after all, somebody prayed for you. Amen. These are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Every man and his household came with Jacob. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died. Do you know how many the Bible says in Genesis, uh, I can't remember what chapter it is, but the last few uh, chapters of Genesis, God lists off the names of the people that came out of Jacob that were going to go into Goshen when the famine started. You know how many names there were in that list? 66. 66. That's a number of books in your Bible in case you never counted. So guess what, Egypt? The Word of God is coming to Egypt. Amen. Now, I'm going to apply this because this is how God gave it to me as I was putting this thing together. Some 400 years ago, God said, Get ready, America. I'm bringing the Word of God to you. Because one thing we know that the Catholic missionaries did not do to Mexico, South America, the Caribbean islands, uh, the eastern shores of America. One thing we know they didn't do was bring and teach people a love for the Bible. We know that. They taught them a love for an idol shepherd or Mary, the mother of God. But they did not bring them the Bible. So from 1620... Until about 1660, that age was known as the Great Migration. And thousands upon thousands of Puritan believers left England, they left the Netherlands, Holland, they left other nations that they had been driven into, and they hired boats, and they came over with just everything they had, and they came over to this land, and they're the ones who built the first towns, uh, Plymouth, Massachusetts. But how hard is it now to find a King James Bible believer in Plymouth, Massachusetts? Or a Hyannis port, amen? But these people came and more came after them and they started towns and they started building universities which were seminaries and they were bringing and teaching and founding these cities, these great cities of America on the word of God, amen. And God was blessing that, wasn't he? God has blessed and has always blessed his word when it's allowed to be preached, when it's uh, read, when it's believed, when it's spoken of, when it's memorized. And from this nation... God has sent thousands of men and women across the world to preach that gospel right out of this King James Bible to all the world. Do you believe that? Say amen. While the great uh, denominations, some of them may have found their birthing place in Europe when they came to the shores of America, they found the fertile field upon which they grew and prospered and many people were being saved. Now hold on to that thought. Verse 6. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceeding, exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. Drive through, pick a town in the United States of America drive to it and through it and see but what see if there's a church in that town a Christian church now they may not be worth going to now but in years gone by there were if a town sprang up churches sprang up with it that's what you're reading here the children of Israel were fruitful and increased 
abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with all these Bible-thumping, Bible-believing, Bible-revering, Bible-quoting Christians all over the country. I believe that at the time America was pulled into the war at World War II, I believe then we were at just about our greatest point because we were a moral people because of the Word of God. And truly God blessed this nation because without America, there was no way that England was going to stop Hitler. There was no way that any of the Asian nations were going to stop Japan. And God fixed it to where we were brought into this fight on both the Atlantic and the Pacific. And there is, and, and the Japanese just laughed and they said, they don't build weapons of war. They don't do anything. We'll, we'll, we'll beat them easily. And upon the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we unleashed hell on those towns. Was that cruelty? No. Those people had, had uh, pledged their body and soul to their emperor. And had we tried to fight a war on the land in Japan, those people would have easily given their lives at a chance to kill an American. Same thing with Hitler. Had we not got involved in the war, in, in fact, think about it. The Canadians, the British, and the Americans all landed in Normandy on June 6, 1941, 1944. And out of all three nations, who had the most losses on D-Day? United States. 3,000 men just at Omaha Beach, slaughtered in one day. And yet, Eisenhower kept sending soldiers. Omar Bradley kept sending them out there. I know they're getting slaughtered, but we ain't got no choice now. We can't go back. The only place, we, the only place we're going to stop in is when we get to Berlin, and that's when we'll stop. So you see, I'm giving you a little history lesson, right? And America was filled with them. Or let's, you can apply that to this. At one time you were filled with the word of God. But now look at verse 8. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. I have an encyclopedia of quotations of famous Americans and the things that they had to say about God and our country and the Bible. And all the way up to um, Truman, Eisenhower, you had men who were not ashamed to let it be known that they were associated with the Word of God. In fact, NASA, when we sent Apollo 8, which was the first trip to the moon, we didn't land at Apollo 8, they just orbited it and headed back home. Their first orbit around the backside of the moon when they first saw the earth coming up, all three of those men decided in advance what they were going to do. They said, we need to do something that will mark this as an event in history. And they all three agreed. It was a King James Bible that when as soon as they got the earth in sight, they said, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said, let there be light and there was light and God saw the light that it was good and God divided the light from darkness and the light he called day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. How about y'all memorizing that one? Those men read that to a nation that readily accepted that, except for Madeline Murray O'Hara. She threw a big fit. She said, government tax money being spent on pushing a religion. They were pushing the right one. That's what made her mad. But now where are we? We got a new Pharaoh, don't we? We got, a new, we got new pharaohs in Washington. We got new pharaohs in Jefferson City. 
We got new pharaohs in St. Louis City, St. Louis County. We got new pharaohs in Jefferson County. We got new pharaohs everywhere who don't like our God. Do they? And I'm here to tell you, without God and the Bible in this nation, we're not a moral society any longer. Our politics are corrupt. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, watch what he does. Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. You know what he just said? I'm afraid of them. I'm afraid of them. They're more than us and they're mightier than us. Verse 10, come on, let us deal wisely with them. Lest they multiply, well, we can't, ha we can't have Christians making more Christians, can we? So what about the laws that are being passed now across this country? Well, what about in California, where they, they basically made it illegal for you to refer to somebody using a pronoun that they themselves do not use for themselves? You'd go to jail for that. God help us! And so it just seems like now we have pharaohs all over America who are saying we can't have more Christians in this country. We won't be able to get our way. We need less. And so, come on, let us deal wisely with them. Verse 10, let's say multiply and it come to pass that whenever there falls out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us and so get them up out of the land. Therefore, watch this, therefore did set... They did set them over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. But the more, listen to this, I love this. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Woohoo! The more Satan does to you, the more you should be digging your heels in and said, I'm not moving. Amen. I'm not going back. I'm not trading in the Word of God and my salvation for nothing. I don't care if they, I don't care if they shut our churches down. I don't care if they start taxing the churches out of existence. I don't care if they start slaughtering us. I'm going to stand for the Word of God and I'll die for the Word of God. But they, they, the more they afflicted him, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. That's going on right now. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with vigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar. Let's count these. In mortar. And in brick. And in all manner of service of the field. How many fingers have I got holding up here? Three. You know what that represents? Lust of the flesh. Lust of the eyes. Pride of life. So let me ask you a question. How many churches in the past several years have been taken down and out of the fight because the pastor got caught up in sins? Or the church people got caught up in sins? And sin just went through that church and just destroyed that, that they may still have a church. They may be acting like it's not, there's nothing wrong with how, how does Benny Hinn and uh, what was her name? Paula White get pictures of themselves holding hands going into a hotel in Rome, Italy. Both of them married, but not to each other. How is it that those two people can still be on TV bilking? people for millions of dollars every year. How can they still be doing that? And I'm telling you, I, I have seen more than one pastor that I knew that it grieved my heart to find out that they are no longer, they're not even in church anymore. Because the devil caught him up in sin. So let's go back to 1940. 
Did you know that in 1940, practically every Protestant church in America all read the King James Bible? It was in their services. It was in their literature. It was in their, if they were a formal church and they had them printed up in the bulletin, that's what they printed up in the bulletin or the order of service or the liturgy or whatever it was. It was all the King James Bible. Is it that way now? No, this is why we've got all these people on the other side of that camera watching us because they can't find a King James church anywhere. What the devil did to the church and churches and pastors all across this land worked. Took the fight right out of them. They made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and brick and all manner of service of the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was, was with rigor. And what was the purpose? Again, what was the purpose of Pharaoh doing this to the Israelites? It was fear. The liberals and the woke people of this country and the, and the idiots... They're not angry at us. They're not upset with us. They're afraid of us. Because if revival broke out and swept across this country, and I mean it was real revival, if real revival took place, I would say probably 99 out of 100 actors should be out of work. And every rock and roll singer and practically all country music singers. That's what should happen. But they are afraid that the Word of God will take effect in our lives and sweep this country and revival will take place and they can't let that happen. So what did they do, Sister Pam? They invent some f false, fake revival at a liberal Methodist seminary out in Asbury, Kentucky, or whatever that town was, and let that sweep the land, and everybody says, Oh, it's the work of the Holy Ghost! Oh, bless God, it's going to... Uh-uh, that was a trick. That was a trap set for those to accept that as revival instead of accepting that as revival. There's your revival right there. You want to have revival? You get inside this Bible, read it all day one day. I guarantee you God will mop up sin out of your life. God will remove doubt out of your mind. God will remove fear out of your heart. And I mean, you, you'll be ready to storm the gates of hell with a little water pistol. <laughs> but it's a water pistol that never runs dry. Amen. I found this article. It's from a book. It's dangerous to believe. Religious freedom and its enemies. Here's what the article, it was like an article written about the book, said, Traditional American Christians have long been on the losing end of culture war contests. And he mentioned, number one, school prayer. Did we lose school prayer? Sure we did. Same-sex marriage, did we lose that issue? Sure we did. And other issues. But recent events, including the Supreme Court decision overruling Texas restrictions on abortion clinics and the mandate that employers provide access to contraception, have added to the sense that religious expression is under attack. I don't need to read that book to tell you that it's under attack. According to the recent Pew Research reports, the percentage of Americans who describe themselves as religiously affiliated has shrunk while the percentage describing themselves as unaffiliated has grown from 2007 to 2014, the percentage who say they are absolutely certain God exists fell to 63% from 71% during the same time period. Now, I mentioned UFOs during Sunday school this morning. I'm just going to throw this in there. Did you know that in this country right now, there are more people who believe in UFOs and aliens than people who believe that there's a God? When you have that as the overwhelming mindset of your country, we're not a Christian nation. Not anymore. And we're trying to raise children in this world 
Sometimes God blesses and it works. And sometimes the devil just gets a hold of them. And it'll be a miracle of God if they ever come back. We've lost our local school districts. We've lost the morality that used to exist in this county. We've lost uh, the battle against teaching sodomy in the school, teaching homosexuality in the school. Schools putting books in their library that adults shouldn't even read. They're so pornographic. We've lost that battle. We've lost it. Why? Because the devil was afraid that we might get some power in us from the Word of God and through the Holy Spirit and we might actually win this war. How about Exodus? Well, look at verse 15. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives of the which uh, the name of the one was Shifra and the name of the other Pua. And he said, when, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then, shall, uh, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God. You know what a midwife is in this story, in this illustration that I'm using? The midwife is a church. That, is, that God is using to birth new people into the kingdom of God. Amen. And once we get them brought into the kingdom of God, then this church will, uh, uh, will, will teach them. We will guide them. We will pray for them. We will stand with them. We'll stand behind them. We'll stand before them. We'll join ourselves with those people and say, Devil, I dare you to come after us. You can't defeat us. You can't bring us down. Because you don't have the power. Do you know why? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called the midwives and said unto them, Why have you done this thing and have saved the men children alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women. Amen! Aren't you glad... That God's women are not like the world's women. Families whose mamas are nothing but drug addicted, sex addicted, alcohol addicted, Jezebels. That's what they are. And a lot of them go to church to make sure that that church doesn't go too far with that Bible issue. We won't stand for that. I'm telling you, the Hebrew women ought to be different than the Egyptian women. Amen, ladies? Uh, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass because the midwives feared God that He made them houses. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. For what reason was Pharaoh doing this? Again, you have to ask the question, why was he doing this? Was he angry at them? No. Was he, uh, did, he, did he not like them having their prayer time? No, it wasn't that. Did, it like, did, he not, did he just hate them because they were Jews? Was he the first Nazi? No, it had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with the fact that he was afraid of God's people. And he said, the only thing that I know that I can do about this is work them until I work them to death. And I'll kill every single male child that comes out of the womb. I'll make sure. And so here's what happens. We get people into our churches. They come to the altar, they ask for Jesus into their heart. And then they come for a while. And Pharaoh says, I'm going to kill him. So somehow, some way, the, the devil is able 
to separate what would have been a new convert for Jesus Christ, to separate him away from the church and away from the word of God. And he'll die that way. And they're after us. Why? They're afraid of us. Mark it down. 1 Samuel 13, turn there. Why was it? Let's read this story. Why was it that the Philistines would not allow a blacksmith in the land of Israel? 1 Samuel 13, 19. Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them what? You know what your sword is, don't you? Who said that? Amen. Way to go, cheeseburger. We can't have these churches reading out of the King James Bible. So, they'll have to come to us to get their tools sharpened. And I guarantee you, we're not going to sharpen them very much. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share, his coulter, his axe, and his mattock. Yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes to sharpen the goads. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and Jonathan with... Uh, but with Saul and with Jonathan, his son, was there found. You know what that means? In this time right now, we don't care how many people go to your church. If you want to have a mega church and have 60, 70, 80,000 people in your big auditorium, more power to you. We just don't want you to have a King James Bible in there. You give them sermons that will make them feel good. You give them sermons that will allow them to stay in their sin. You give them sermons that do not mention hellfire and God's judgment and God's wrath. You give them nice things to say and that there is peace, peace, peace. But God says there is no peace. You give them all that candy stuff. Candy. You give them all that candy and sweets sermons. And we don't mind if you churches stay open. But them King James churches... They got to go. Y'all see what I'm getting at? Y'all see where I'm going with this? Has this, has not this very thing happened in our lifetime? We've seen it happen. And if you don't believe me, ask Brother George. He was around during World War II. He knows all about it. I'm just kidding. Nehemiah chapter 4, turn there. Nehemiah, Nehemiah, if you want to call it that. Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 4. Boy, you'll remember this. You won't forget it. If you find Ezra, go back to... Actually, go forward. Ezra, Nehemiah, Nehemiah, chapter 4, verse 1. Two men, Sanballat and Tobiah. They had heard that the Israelites not only were returning back to Jerusalem, but they heard that they were building or rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. And they said, we cannot allow that to take place. If they build that wall, we will never be able to penetrate their fortresses. We will never accomplish victory over them. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 4, But it came to pass when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth. And took great indignation and mocked the Jews and spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what do these feeble Jews? That's how, that's how, uh, that's how Whoopi Goldberg sees us. You feeble, stupid, ignorant, fundamentalist Christians who believe the Bible. You're, you're just way out of the times. You're what's holding America back. No, we're the salt that's holding America together.
And you can send Whoopi Goldberg a copy. I'll put it on CD for you. And you can send it to Whoopi Goldberg. Care of Michael Hoggard. What do these feeble Jews, will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. In other words, he said, Not only are these stupid Jews trying to build a wall which will never work, but they're so stupid that, and their wall is going to be so weak if a, if a fox came by and wet on it, the whole thing would come collapsing down. They think that if they put enough pressure on us, we'll go away. But we're not going away. Did any of them go away in the book of Acts? Hardly. You had, uh, who was it? Uh, um, Ananias and Sapphira? They, yeah, they, they went away. A few others left. But every time they persecuted the church anywhere in the book of Acts, they grew and they multiplied and they went everywhere they were skipped. They, would, they were kicked out of Jerusalem. Then they went over to the next town and they were preaching Jesus to them. And people got saved. Amen. That's what they think about us though. They think if they can apply the pressure... Get us caught up in enough sins. Make us look like idiots. Then we'll go away. I don't care if there ain't but 300 of us left. That's all God needs, isn't it? So verse 3, now Tobiah the Ammonite was, he's, uh, verse... Um, for hear, O our God, for we are despised and turn their reproach upon their own head and give them for prey in the land of captivity and cover not their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. And we've always been told, you pray for sinners, pray for people like you're, you're cutting down uh, uh, Whoopi Goldberg, you should be praying for her. I, I prayed for her, prayed God shut her mouth. Listen, these people, for the most part, they have, they have uh, sold their souls to the devil to get where they are right now. Cover not their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together under the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. Somebody say amen. When you hear them mocking us, when you hear them mocking our ideas of marriage... And that he's a man, she's a woman, and I'm not, I don't have to worry about, did I call him by the right pronoun? Maybe Brother Sterling is a them. Or an it. You go to jail in California for not addressing somebody with the right gender pronoun. And there's 93, what, 93 some odd different genders now? No, there's two. Just ask any plumber. Amen. Ask any veterinarian. They know. Oh, listen. People, you get a mind to work and a heart to work. They can't stop us. Verse 7, But it came to pass when Samballot and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped and that they were very wroth and conspired all them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. And that's exactly what this is about. There was a day when our son Matthew, he, he come back from... Hillsborough High School. And he said, Dad, tomorrow they're having Gay Pride Day at the school. Boy, that burnt me up. And um, I called the school principal. And I said, uh, is this really happening in, in the school tomorrow? She said, yes, it is. And I said, well, I don't think that should be taught that should be what's taught in the school and she said well to be honest with you we don't have a choice we have to do it state board of education is telling us to do it so we have to do it i said well let me ask you this if i send my son to school tomorrow 
Can he still pray over his meal at lunch? She said, yeah. And I said, I have a feeling that all these sodomites in school are going to have gay pride this and gay pride that and rainbows and this and that and the other wearing on their shirts. If I sent my son to school tomorrow with a verse of scripture on it, would he be kicked out? She said, nope. And if I would have had the time, I would have made him a t-shirt that said, Thou shalt not lie with a man as with a woman in his abomination unto God. Or whatever that verse says. And then I would have put on the back what it says in Romans chapter 1. Even their women burned. Even their women changed the natural use of their body and they burned in their lust one for another. And I would have said, Son, wear this to school. Yes, Exactly. The sodomites get the whole month of, month of June veterans. Listen to, that, listen to that little girl back there. She's got more sense than most of the teachers at her school has. Bunch of godless nonsense. Anyway, in verse 8, And they conspired all of them together to come to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and said, Watch against them day and night because of them. And that's what it's going to take. We are to walk circumspectly where you better have your eyes open to the days that we're living in right now. And don't back down for nobody. Amen. Let me move this along. Um, turn to Acts chapter 4. I think that's it. Acts chapter 4, verse 1. As they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. What were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes? Is it because they... What, what were they doing? Were they anti-Semitic? Were they going after the Christians because practically all of them at that time were Jews? No. They were afraid that the preaching of the cross would reach out even to the people, the Jews who were under the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees' authority and remove them, make them free. Do you know why those Catholic priests came to our radio station office in, in Turkana and said, get that Muzungu off the radio station. He's saying stuff about the Catholic Church. You think that they didn't like me? You think they just didn't like how I looked or didn't like how I talked or whatever? No, they're afraid. They're afraid that I'm going to preach the gospel and it's going to set some Catholics free in that town and they'll quit going to that church and they won't be giving them all the hard-earned money to get out of hell. Amen! That's the truth. Anyway, be grieved that they taught the people. Verse 3, And they laid hands on them and put them in the hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide, howbeit many of them which heard the words believed. And the number of the men was about 5,000. Mm. So verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and that they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. I'm going to ask you a question this morning as, as we wind this message down. Have you been with Jesus? They may call you unlearned. They may call you ignorant. They may call you a fool. But you are wiser than they are, smarter than they are. You, you hold fast your beliefs and never let them go. And because they can't change you over to their side, they're afraid of you. They don't want you witnessing to them. They don't want you bringing your Bible to work. They don't want you, hey, you guys that go to public school, did you know that there's not a law anywhere in the state of Missouri that says you cannot take your Bible to school with you? And when I found that out, when I was in high school, I made it a point to start carrying my Bible with my other books 
every day I went to school. Now, I wasn't trying to get in anybody's face about it. I'm just going, if they say I can do it, then I'm going to do it. And I don't mind being associated with the man who's in this book who died for my sins. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I don't want my kids or my grandkids to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think the people who ought to be ashamed are the perverts who are running the schools and the county offices and up in, up in St. Louis! Who walk around in these gay pride parades naked! They're the ones who ought to be ashamed, not us. Um, I've been asked, uh, Brother John, this was his idea, and I agree with it. Um, I'm, I'm going to close this out, and I'm going to ask uh, my wife and Alicia and her kids if they would come meet me down here. And um, could I ask as many as who would come down and pray for us? Would y'all do that?